Well, take out those notes. We are in the finale of a series we are calling Uncomfortable Christianity. And the entire job of this series and goal of these these messages is just to challenge and to stretch you. We just really believe that if your faith isn't challenging you, then it is not changing you. And so we've tried to get some messages for you during this series that would kind of stretch you a little bit, get you out of your comfort zone. And today's message is going to be one of those. It's going to be a message that I believe will be a resource for our church for for years and years to come. And I'm going to talk to you for a bit today about evangelism and sharing your faith with people. And when we have this idea of evangelism and sharing your faith, it kind of it's taboo in our in our culture. I mean, I don't know if you've realized this, you can talk about anything in our culture except don't talk about religion, don't talk about your relationship with Jesus, don't talk about church. You leave all that out of there. And um, I used to think it was like a personality thing where people are like, you know, if they have that kind of personality, they'll reach out to their friends. But then I've realized it has nothing to do with personality. I actually think because you'll share anything. I mean, I've seen some of your social media. So you'll, you'll share a recipe like everybody's got to try this recipe. And you'll share your workout plan. You'll share your kids recital. None of us want to see that, but you'll share it. And. So I realize there's more reasons behind it than actually the idea that you don't want to share it. It's, uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons. I actually saw a stat the other day that said 52% of Christians, these are, these are people that go to church, Christians, 52% say it's disrespectful to share your faith with someone from a different religious belief. 52%. you got a majority of Christians that have bought into a lie that it's actually disrespectful or even wrong to share their belief. Another stat I found was that 78% of Christians um, would, would share their belief. They just don't know what to do. They feel uncomfortable with it. So I thought because of that, it's such a big group that is dealing with this. Let's, let's hit it head on today. And there's going to be a lot of notes for you to take. And so if you're aware of this online, you can find those notes online. But I'm going to give you today five ways to share your faith. Five ways to share your faith. Because I believe it is the responsibility of the church that if God has done something in us, then it should go through us to a lost and broken world out there today. That, that, that your faith, when it is authentic, should transform a lost and broken world. And God cares about lost people. He cares about people that are not part of his family yet. And we are going to take on that assignment today to figure out how do we share our faith with a world that is lost and broken. And, and I, I get all this from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to turn there where Paul challenges the church, and he says it this way, and I want you to see it. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. Let me just pause for just a second and let you know what that means. That Jesus did not come to bring, bring behavior modification into your life. He did not come to make your bad life a little bit better. He did not come to just improve what you're going through. Jesus came to make dead people alive. He's come to make you totally brand new. Come on, give him a little bit better praise in that today, church. And when you experience the gospel, when you experience the life-changing power of God, Everything changes in your life. And this is the, the new creation that we can become. We, we call it being born again. And if you've never had that opportunity, at the end of the service today, we're going to give you an opportunity to submit your life to Christ. I'm telling you, when you do it, everything changes in your life. Are we just thankful that our God is still changing lives? That he's still transforming people from the inside out. So he says, you, uh, the new is here. Verse 18. All of this is from God. Now let me just pause it's, it's not your pastor, it's not your church. It's, no, 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 the life change that's happened is from God. Are we thankful that he's the one that's done it? He says, all of it is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. What did he do? He says, listen, now that you've been reconciled to God, now you're assigned to go and reconcile other people. So what does reconciliation mean? It's right there in your notes. It means to restore peace and unity between two parties. Now you know this if you've ever had to be a go-between between two relationships and you've had to bridge the gap with them. You know, you know what it's like to bring conflict resolution 
That's what Jesus did. You see, there was a gap between man and God, and that gap was there because of sin. And sin separates us from God. But Jesus came and reconciled the two parties. So now we can go boldly to God. We can have a relationship with God. And then he says this. He goes, what Jesus did, you now are called to do. Like this is a big assignment. I want you to see it. Look at verse 19. And God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. The church can learn something about that. And then it says like this, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Have you ever had that friend that committed you to something without even asking you? Like, hey, I just want you to know, I signed you up for that 5K. We're doing it together. You're like, I didn't want to do that 5K. It's like, it's like the, the, the girl that comes up to you. She's like, hey, I just want you to know my kids are selling Girl Scout cookies. I, I signed you up for five boxes. You're like, well, that's not good, but where are the boxes at? Come on, somebody. We're going to have... You, you giving your life to Christ automatically signs you up to a commitment to help reconcile a lost and dying world that is away from God. It is our assignment. And look what he says. He's given us the message of reconciliation. We, talking about us as believers, are therefore Christ ambassadors. This is the phrase he uses. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What is an ambassador? He uses this phrase ambassador. So he says, we have the message of reconciliation, and as that, we go out as ambassadors. An ambassador is the highest ranking diplomat sent as a representative from one country to another. So what they do is they are a sent one, someone that is sent out from one nation to live in another nation to represent the other nation. So for instance, if I were a diplomat to an, an ambassador to Egypt, I am an American citizen, but I'm living in Egypt. I don't become an Egyptian, I'm an ambassador. I'm there to represent America's ideas there. Now, now my citizenship doesn't change. I'm just not in the place of my citizenship right now. Does that make sense? And, and let me just remind you as Christians, your citizenship is not on this earth. It's not on this earth. Paul tells us your citizenship is in heaven. Like this is a big deal. We, we, are, we have to understand that our primary allegiance is to represent heaven on earth, to bring heaven into every scenario on this earth. Now, I want you to get this because if you don't understand this, you will think the primary goal of your life is to get to heaven one day. And, and that's, that's important. We want you there. But if the only goal of your life is to get you to heaven, then the best thing that could happen to you is as soon as you raise your hand in that service, submit your life to the Lord, at that moment, God raptures you up, he's taking you out, and then you'll never have to deal with sin and temptation and a bunch of the struggles in this world. But God keeps us here, why? He keeps us here because the primary goal of your life is not to simply get to heaven, but it's to bring heaven to earth so that we can go throughout this lost and broken world and it can look more and more like heaven because we're involved in it. Tampa Bay should look more like heaven because Radiant Church is there. Everywhere we go. Every place that we step into, every restaurant we go to, like, like every place should look more like heaven. You know why? Because I'm an ambassador for heaven. And so I go on behalf of heaven to bring heaven onto whatever situation I'm in. Like, I want you to think about this when you're driving. Like, I'm representing heaven right now. Some of you are like, I'm going to get them there real quick. You know? <laughs> That's funny right there. I want you to think about this and how you treat your spouse. I want you to think about this and how we, we reach out to our friends and family members. I, I think we have to understand we are kept here on this planet to impact people so that they can experience heaven and then get there one day. That's our whole assignment. Rick Warren said it so beautifully. He says this way, the only thing we cannot do in heaven is sin and witness. And God did not leave us on this planet to sin. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, darn, like that was... No, 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 he left you on this planet to be a witness for his glory and his honor. 
So, so I'm gonna tell you how to do that and we're gonna get really practical about it. But before I do, I have to get, help you overcome some of the lies that we believe and a lot of our lies, we be, lies that we believe keep us from stepping out and being the ambassador God's called us to be. So let's talk about these. So there's, there's some lies. Here's the first lie that we believe is that faith is a private matter. And I've heard people say this all the time, like it's, it's private, it's not for me to share with anybody else. But the truth of it is, is that sincere belief always overflows into action. And these are not in your notes, by the way. I had them in your notes, but your notes were like 19 pages long when I was done with them. So I had to trim it down. So maybe at the end of this, you'll just take a little picture. All right, here's it. When you, when you sincerely believe, it's gonna overflow into action in people's lives. Here's the next one. Imposing my beliefs on others, that isn't loving. And we hear that from the world today. Like, it's not loving. Let them, let them do whatever they wanna do. But the truth is, the truth is that real love doesn't withhold truth from people. And if heaven and hell are realities, and they are, then it is, it, is, it is the most unloving thing that we could do is to keep our truth to ourselves and not bring the gospel into a lost and dying world. Like, like we gotta change our perspective. No, we love people so much that we're gonna give them the truth of the gospel. All right, here's the next one, is that I have issues and will be considered a hypocrite. I've heard this one all the time. Like, I would share, but they know my life. Here, here, here's, I wanna help you. I wanna help you with this, all right? Because, because people disqualify themselves off of this thing. Let me say it this way. Since Jesus came and then ascended into heaven after he rose from the grave, since that moment 2,000 years ago, there has only been imperfect people that God has used. Only imperfect. So if you say, I'm imperfect, then great, you're qualified to be used by God. Here, here's what I want you to understand, ready? Because the power of the gospel is in the message, not in the messenger. So, so don't disqualify yourself. The, the power of God can change their life despite. You look at the scripture, God used donkeys, crazy people, wild things. You have no clue who God could use, so don't disqualify yourself. Here's another lie. Another lie is it's not my gifting. Aaron, you're gifted for that. Billy Graham, he's got that gift. I don't have that gift. Let me tell you, it is not about gifting. It is about obedience. Because the truth is, is that everyone is commanded to participate in the Great Commission. Y'all with me today, church? Like, it's everybody's command. Here's, here's the next lie. The next line is speaking up for my faith could cost me friends, my job, influence, money. And I hear this and I'm like, wow. Have you read church history? Have you heard about the martyrs of our faith that gave everything for the gospel? Everything to have this Bible translated for us? Everything to see the gospel go forward? This is normal. A faith that costs nothing is worth nothing. And if you have a faith that's really real in your life, it's gonna cost you some stuff. Christianity, the truth is, is that persecution and suffering for our faith is a part of Christianity. Like it's part of what God's called us to do. So you're gonna lose some friends, you might lose a business deal, but the gospel's worth it all. All right, all right, let's keep going. The lie is that if they're of the elect, and I hear this from my reformed friends, they just, they love to just find this excuse. Well, if they're elect, God will save them anyway. All right, and, and let me just tell you what that is. That's called an excuse. An excuse, because here's what the scriptures say. The scripture says that God desires that none should perish. So let me help you. At all of our campuses, I want you to respond. If God's desire is that none should perish, right now on the planet, are people perishing? Yes or no? Yes. So whose fault is it? All right. Let's move on. All right, so here's another lie. That person is too far gone. And I hear that one all the time. Aaron, you don't understand. They've already deconstructed. They've already messed. Like, they're already so far gone. You don't know their past. You don't know their issues. Here's, here's what it is. Our church is at such a size. It is so amazing to hear the stories of life change. If you knew who was in the room with you right now, your faith would be built. I mean, just look at your neighbor. The fact that God saved them. Come on, somebody. Some of you are looking at them going, oh, I know, I know. But they're the exception. They're not the exception. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, here, here's the truth. The truth is, is that if there's a heartbeat, there's hope. And that's the truth of the gospel, is that there's heartbeat, there's a hope. One more, one more, one more. It's a lie, is I don't know what to say. And I get this. This is a legit uh, thing that we believe. I just don't know what to say. I would go out, I would speak, but I don't know what to say. And here's the truth. The truth is, is that sharing your faith is easier than you think. All right, there's a lot of phones out, so... Yeah. <laughs> 
Give you a second, give you a second. I want you to, I want you to get it, because the enemy's gonna lie. He's gonna lie to you. He's gonna say you can't do it, and it's a lie. You, you can be an ambassador that walks out this faith with confidence. Y'all good? Y'all good? Y'all got it? All right, all right, let's get, move on. So here's the five things. You're like, Aaron, there's so many points. I know, I'm excited. Five things, five ways to share your faith. Number one is you share your story. This is what we as Christians call your testimony. And you've got a testimony. You've got a reason, you've got a way that God has transformed your life and it is an incredible story of God's goodness in your life. I wanna challenge you, don't diminish the story of what God has done in your life. Don't compare your story with somebody else's story and go, well, my story is not that dramatic or my story is not that perfect or my story is a little messy. Let me tell you, your story is vital to what, to, your story is so vital to the impact of other people's lives, but you gotta learn how to share it. The, the Bible says it this way. It said, those who are, believe in the Son of God have the testimony of God in them. Like there's a testimony in you. There's a, there's a story of what God's done in your life. And I used to get so frustrated about this because in, growing up, we do a thing called testimony time. Come on, y'all don't remember that in church where people just stand up and give a testimony. It was always kind of weird. But I always compared my testimony. I always looked at their story and I'm like, and they were always like, you know, they were like the person from Breaking Bad. And they were like, you know, doing meth and like stealing cars and, you know, they beat up their mom. And I'm like, this is a lot. This is intense. And then, and then they got saved, and now they're like a preacher. And I'm like, wow, like, man, that, that's like extreme right there. And, and then I looked at my story, and I was like, I grew up in a normal Christian home, and I was pretty good for a while and had kind of some hiccups. But, 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 but let me just tell you, my story matters. My story is some of y'all don't have that crazy testimony. Your story matters. When you recognize what God has done in your life when it comes to even just your life before Christ and how he protected you and how he shaped you, like I'm believing it over my kids. They're not gonna have some crazy testimony. Their testimony is gonna be like, my parents raised me in the way that they should go and the way that we should go. And you know what? And at an early age, I realized there's life with God and there's life without God and I'm choosing life with God. Come on, that's a good testimony to have. I wanna hear that. Let's bring that one up in testimony time right there. Your, your testimony matters. People can argue with your theology, but they can't argue with your testimony. Your testimony has the ability to unlock faith inside of people's lives to where they look at you and go, if God can do it for them, he can do it for me. And our testimony has power. So what is this? This is where the Bible calls this witnessing. That's why he calls it. He says, he says I'm going to send you out as witnesses. Witnessing is sharing your personal experiences regarding Jesus. So you're not going out to, to fight people in, in apologetics and prove to them they're all wrong. No, no, we're just sharing what Jesus has done in our lives. And Jesus sent us out and said, you're gonna be my witnesses. I want you to understand this. Jesus said, you will be my witness. He did not say, you will be my attorney. There's a big difference between the two. Like, you've taken on your responsibility. I gotta defend the faith. You don't have to defend the faith. You just have to share about how faith has impacted your life. And when you share it in your life of how faith has impacted you, it'll impact the people around you. Your testimony matters. Uh, Peter said it this way, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You, you went through that divorce. How did you get through it, Jesus? You, you, you're dealing with a terrible cancer diagnosis. How are you getting through it? Jesus is getting me through it. Like, you, 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 you lost your job. You're in a tough season. I know, but I got joy because Jesus is with me. I'm telling you, the hope is that my story is going to help other people's stories. It works. Your testimony is divided up into four parts. I'll give it to you real quick. We teach this in our foundations course. It's helpful. Here's your, your first part is my life before Jesus. And I would challenge you this week, just take a, a few minutes and write this out because this really matters when it comes to sharing your faith. The second part is, man, how I realized my need for Jesus. That might have been showing up to a church service. That might have been watching some video online. That might have been a friend that introduced you to him. The third one is, how, is why I committed my life to Christ. So now I'm gonna look at it and go, okay, this is what I did. This is why I made this decision. And here's the last one, is the difference Jesus has made in my life. And everybody's got this. And I would challenge you, I should be able to run, if I run into you at a grocery store, I should be able to challenge you and go, hey, give me those four points. Let me tell you how Jesus did this in my life. 
And it's not long, it's not exhaustive, you don't have to sit us down for 82 minutes, just give us the, the, the bullet points and watch how your testimony will impact people's lives. Can I hear a good amen? amen. All right, you're gonna share your story. Number two, how are we gonna share our faith? We're gonna be kind to people. <laughs> I'm gonna challenge you to be kind to people. I heard a lady the other day at a funeral I was preaching. She was talking about the kindness of this, this woman that had passed. And she said, she challenges her grandkids. She said, whenever people ask you, what do you want to be when, they, when you grow up? Don't tell them astronaut. Don't tell them doctor. Tell them, when I grow up, I want to be kind. Wow. And I said, wow. Can't the world, or can't we learn something about that today? Yes. Christians should be the kindest people on the planet. They should be overflowing in grace because God has poured so much grace into their life. They should be filled with joy because at one time we were destined for death and separation from God, but God who is rich in mercy saved us, transformed us, and every day we should wake up going, I can't believe it, I'm saved, I'm saved. Like that's a big deal. We should be filled with so much joy and so much kindness and our desire is to let the rest of the world experience that also. Remember what Paul said. Paul said it is God's kindness that is intended to lead you to repentance. You do not shame people into repentance. You do not fear them and, and, and make them afraid so they repent. You show them the kindness of God and watch how the kindness of God leads them to repentance. That's why I never understood, understood the, the turn or burn mentality. Like, you know, you know, like standing on the street corner, like, you're going to hell. Turn or burn, and I'm like, and I get it. I hope their intention's good, I hope it's awesome. Like, but I remember growing up, and I, I, we'd have these guys, and they were all from this one little church, and they'd all stand on the street corners, and they were angry, angry people. And, and so I would listen to them, and they were always like, you're a sinner, you're evil, you, you, God hates you, you know, it was like really intense, and I was like, I'm just a nice boy, you know, I was like. <laughs> so one time I got bold enough to like talk to him. I said, why do y'all do this? Well, you know what, just God's angry at the sinners. And I was like, I don't know if that's like it. And I was like, well, tell me, how many have like turned so they don't burn? How many? Zero. Why? Because it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And by the way, if, if, if you've never heard this before, I just want you to know God loves you so much. And it was the kindness of God that sent his son to the, to the earth. And when he came to this earth, he did not come with his finger pointed at us, teaching us everything we've done wrong. He came with his arms extended, hanging on that cross, showing you his love for you and showing you how kind he actually is, that he would take the sacrifice needed for your sins and for mine. Can we give him a little bit of praise for the fact that it is his kindness? It's his kindness. You cannot dishonor someone. Let me let you get this. You cannot dishonor someone and lead them to Christ at the same time. You cannot speak down to them and expect them to step up into what God has for their life. You want to see people one for Christ? Then you learn to honor them celebrate them, whether it's, it's the coworker or the child, don't shame them. Don't, don't, don't sit there and go, well, you're a sinner going to hell right now. Like, 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 like that could be true. The fact is, is that's not gonna work. What you gotta do is you gotta learn how to build a bridge through kindness that gives you an avenue into their life so that you can then step over that bridge and bring the truth of the gospel into their life. That's why when I preach, I always smile. I always tell funny jokes. Well, why? Because I want you to laugh, and you're laughing, and then I shove truth right down your forehead. Yeah. It's true. You're like, ah, I, I like this guy. And then I, that's what we do. Be kind. Be kind. Like, love people. Forgive people. Show grace to people. Like, 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 don't be mean, be nice. I grew up in a church, and the, the holiest woman in the church that everybody just was like, man, she's so, she's so connected with God. And she was angry all the time. I just remember, like, she might love God, but she hates me. 
Jesus loves people. He loves people. All right, number three. Number three, how do we, how do we live in such a way that we share our faith? We're gonna, we're gonna share the gospel. We're gonna share the gospel. Every summer I would go on a mission trip. I'd stand like, you know, go and witness to random people. I mean, random people at parks and all these kind of things. And I'd share the gospel. And I remember one time the Lord challenged me and said, Aaron, why do you go around the world to do this, but you won't do it to your neighbor? Like, like, like you'll, you'll share it in Radiant Kids, but will you share it with your friend? Like, like the gospel is something to be shared with the world around us. And you, I know what you're thinking. You're going, well, Aaron, that's your job. That's why you're here. I'm here to learn. Like, no, no, no. It's our responsibility to take the gospel and share it. Romans says it this way. How then will they call on him if they don't, do not believe? And how are they to believe in him if they've never what? They've never heard. And, and by the way, I'm meeting more and more people in America who said, I've never heard the gospel before, ever. And how are they to hear without somebody doing what? Preaching, preaching. Like it's our assignment to present the gospel to them. So what is the gospel? We learned this in our Romans course. The gospel is right here. Paul outlined it in 1 Corinthians. He says, for what I've received, I pass on to you as of first importance. What's the most important thing I want people to know? That Christ died for our sins. What is the gospel? It's not you can be a good person. It's not that, man, church is good. It's not that here's how you spend your money. The, the first importance is that man was separated from God, but Jesus came and he died for our what? Our sin. Like Jesus did that. And then what did he do? According to the scriptures, and then he was buried, so he actually died. He, it was over, but we, it wasn't over because then he was raised on the third day, according to scripture, which we'll celebrate next week. And that's the gospel that we can present this to a lost and dying world. I remember I grew up with a mom and she felt it was like her personal responsibility to share that gospel with every single person she came in contact with. I mean, we were, we'd be in a cab and she'd like, hey, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? I'm like, like I, and, and as a kid, I would cringe. I'd always like, mom, come on. We're, we're sitting in a hot tub. On a, we're on a cruise with, with our family and she's always talking to somebody else. And just, oh, I just won that person to the Lord. Just prayed for that person. They just got saved right there at the buffet line. I'm like, in the buffet line? How in the world? It was just part of her nature. Like, she still comes. She'll, she'll come to, to Tampa. She lives up in Pensacola, but she'll come to Tampa all the time. And we'll be at a restaurant. And, and she, she'll ask the waitress, hey, can I pray for you? Did you know Jesus? Do you know who my son is? And I'm like... <laughs> Mom, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> you got to come to radio. And there's more people who've come to radio because my mom is just like, you got you to gotta get saved. You got to get right with God. You got to come to this church. Like, my mother in law is the exact same way. My mother in law, Katie's mom, is so much like this. So we were in London a few months back and we were in a cab and I could just see her. She, she just kept finding ways to insert the gospel. We drive by a church. She's like, oh, that's a church. Do you go to church? So it's like, it was like every single little opportunity we had. Like, it was just, it, it was, it was, and I'm sitting there in the back seat going, I need to do this more. Like, forget, forget the stage, like to our friends and family everywhere. Like, do we present the gospel to people? Let me just ask you a question, all of our campuses. When is the last time you, you personally told somebody the gospel message and invited them to follow Christ? And I think if we were honest, probably 99% of us, it's been a long, long time. So let me give you five things for this. This is not in your notes. We're almost done. I promise you we're almost done. But here's the way I describe it. If I'm, if I'm giving the gospel to someone, and I've used this many times, um, it's here's the five things. Ready? That God created. So I don't know when he created. I don't know how long ago that was. But I know God's behind everything. He created us on purpose, for a purpose. There's a purpose for him. Here's the second one. Is that man sinned, and we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But there has to be a solution to sin. And here's what it is, is that God redeemed. And that's what Jesus did. He came and became that sacrifice. And then number four is that man responds. And now the ball's in your court. You have to respond. And the last one is that God rewards. And aren't we thankful for a God that rewards, that when we respond, he rewards us with forgiveness and life and life to the full and abundance. Man, a lot of cameras are out. So I always, I always feel weird. I'm in those pictures. I'm like, oh. So this is the gospel right here that you can present to anybody and you find opportunities to bring that into the equation. You go, well, I'm just not, I don't have the ability. You, I'm telling you, the message, the power is not in you. The power is in the message right there. And when you present the message, watch how people's lives change. All right, we're almost done. Number four, how do we share our faith? You pray for people. You pray for people. Prayer 
is the most powerful way to invite God into a relationship. Whether it's a friend or a coworker or a spouse, if you wanna see God change their life, pray for them. People can reject my preaching, but they are defenseless against my prayers. I can pray for someone right in front of me and it can impact their life. And I can pray for someone on the other side of the globe and it can impact them the same. Prayer has power and prayer can change people's lives. So if you want to see someone get saved, pray for them. Pray for them. Uh, Paul says it this way. I urge you then, first of all, let my petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people. Like find ways to pray for people. So a few months back, we're in this family reunion we do every October and my brother and my dad and I are going to the pizza place to go pick up the pizzas. And we're betting my dad. We're going, Dad, I bet you can't get a discount on this food. And this is the way Burks roll, okay? So he's like, no, I'll get a discount. Not only get a discount, I'll get a 20%. I'm getting a discount on this deal. We're like, you're not. This is like a specialty pizza place. You're not going to get a discount. No, no, I am. So we get to the restaurant. He goes up to the counter. So he's at the counter. We're hiding in the back going, we're going to watch this thing and watch him try. And he's like a salesman. He's going to try so we're watching him trying to work this deal with the cashier, you know, trying to work this deal. And I'm like, it's not going well at all. Well, a few minutes later, we look up and she's crying. And we're like, dad, you crossed the line. We don't need the discounts, five bucks, you know, let's move on. We see her crying. He's like, hey, 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 guys, come on up here. He goes, hey, this is, these are my sons. He didn't say this is my, my son who's a pastor. These are my sons. We believe in the power of prayer. We're going to pray with you. Hey, and, he, and we're like, well, what's going on? He, she's, and he, my dad said it this way. He's like, he's like, I was just asking her. And I looked at her and I said, I knew she was having a bad day. I said, is everything okay? She said, well, my mom just went into the hospital and they don't think she has much time left. She's in the Caribbean and, and I'm here and I'm just, I, 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 I'm just grieving right now. And he goes, well, I think that's why God put us in your path. We grabbed hands. I mean, there was a line. There's people around. Who cares? Why do we make this weird? Grab hands, pray. You know what I didn't do? Prayer emoji, gotcha, put you on the list. We'll see you later. Stinks about the discount. No, we grabbed hands and we prayed for her right there. Prayer has power, has power. I would encourage you this, stop the I'm praying for you business. When they tell you a need, grab your hand right there and let's pray right here in this moment. And watch how that can be an opening to share faith with them. By the way, for your friends and family who don't know Christ, I, I would challenge you, put them on a list and start praying for them. Start praying for that child. Start praying for that coworker. Start praying for that person that God's going to put you on your heart to invite to Easter. Prayer works. Christians don't have the right to preach to people that they haven't prayed for first. So when I am, when God's put somebody on my heart, I put them on a list and I start praying for them daily. God, open up an opportunity, open up a door, put it in my path. And I'm telling you, it works. Which, by the way, if you have a child away from the faith, especially those young adults and college age and, and, and those that are 20s and 30s that are away from the faith. Here's what I've, I've, I tell people to pray. Pray that God would supernaturally put a friend in their life to bring them back to the Lord. Because we've seen it at Radiant. We've seen it from people. I meet fam, uh, parents all the time that are from Indiana and Michigan and Wisconsin, all those states that people are miserable in. They all come to Florida to live. <laughs> come on, somebody. And I meet them. I go, why are y'all here? They're like, oh, my, my, we wanted to see the church that my child got involved in, that we thought it was over. We thought there's no chance. But we kept praying, and as we prayed, they met some friend that invited them to Radiant, and they got saved, and we've seen them get baptized. They're overwhelmed. Why? Because I'm telling you, prayer works. It works. We're going to end this service in just a second, praying for your lost friends and family members. Watch what happens when you pray for them. Last and not least, we'll close with this one, is you invite them to church. Invite them to church. This should be a tag team collaboration between me and you. That you invite your friends that I'm not connected to. I'm not going to invite your friends. I don't know them. But you invite your friends and you do what only you can do. And I'll do what God has gifted me to do, which is to bring the gospel. And I've made it a point. We've never had a service in 10 years of doing this church where we haven't presented the gospel at the end of the service. And it's crazy to me. I mean, we could be preaching about anything. We can preach about money. We can preach about conflict resolution. We can preach about parenting. But at the end of that message, the gospel's preached, and somebody's crying in the back and going, I had got my life right with God into the parenting message. It doesn't matter because the gospel can change their life, but you got to get them in the room. You got to get them in the room. The invite matters. 
Uh, we did the stats. Um, eight out of 10 people will come to Easter if they're invited. But what's interesting for me is we do an Easter survey every year with our church. We'll do it next Sunday, next weekend. And uh, so I think, you know, I don't know, 15,000 people last year at Easter, something crazy. And out of those, 64% of them um, came to church because they were invited by a friend. That's our church. 64% are in the room because a friend or family member told them about it. That's a big deal. So it shows me that people are one invite away from their life being totally transformed. Jesus spoke to the disciples in parables and he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. It's a beautiful analogy. Like God has prepared this thing for his son. His servants, he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. And some people are gonna refuse the invite. So what does Jesus do? He said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. What is he saying? I've got a banquet prepared. I've got, I've got amazing things in store. I've got plans. I've got purposes. God has so much in store for your life. But people didn't come to it. So this is verse nine. So he said, go to the street corners. Invite to the banquet anyone you find. I'm telling you, I want you to invite anybody. I don't care their background. I don't care who they voted for. I don't care what they're struggling with. You invite them. And then the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find and the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. And that's our desire. Our desire is to create a church where, where people feel comfortable bringing their friends and family to so that the gospel message can be presented. They can experience the banquet that God has for them. And here's what I've realized about an invite. You can't guarantee their salvation, but you can extend the invitation. You can, and I'm telling you, there ain't nothing more ex exhilarating than when you give that invite to that friend or that family member or that coworker, and they sit in that service, and I tell you at the end of the service, close your eyes and bow your head, and you're doing this business. You're peeking, and that's okay, because you see that hand go up, you go, man, I was part of an eternity-changing decision that they just made. God will change their life gotta get them there one story and then we're done probably one of my favorite stories of all I've never preached this at Radiant um, it was probably a few years into the church for a few hundred people one location in South Tampa and I had this lady and her family start coming to the church they were stationed at Big Dill and they started coming and she really wants to get involved they had been out of the church for a while starts getting involved and her husband is a staunch vocal atheist like I want nothing to do with God but my wife wants me in this church and so I remember them going like, is it okay? Like he's an atheist, I, but he's gonna come with me. He's gonna sit and I'm like, yeah, of course, of course. So then he's like, well, if I'm gonna be here, I might as well serve. Can I serve? We're like, you're not a Christian. Like, we're like, well, I'm, I'm not a deal. I, 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 I wanna serve. I wanna, my, my, my kids are in the kids ministry. Like I wanna be on the safety team. You know, the ones with like the little earpieces. I mean, that's like, they're saved, but some of them barely. So don't mess up, all right? They'll get you. So, so he's like, can I serve? And like, yeah, yeah, well, sure. Like we actually battled this. I know this is hard for some of your theology. Like how do we have, let someone belong before they actually even believe? And we we're like, well, we gotta create a, like who else is gonna, who else are we gonna reach? Are we trying to just reach church people? Like let's create a spot for them. So we battled it and people left the church going, I can't believe you have an atheist serving in your church. Go, where else do we want them to go? Let's create a spot for them. So, he, I mean, it was funny because people like lead the message and they go up to talk to him. They're like, wow, what a powerful sermon. He's like, I don't believe anything about it. <laughs> it's weird. Getting involved in small groups. And we're like, why are you here? I don't know. I just wanted some people to hang out with. Well, do you want to grow in your faith? No, I don't believe anything about that. Well, that's, this is kind of messed up. So I'm not talking about a few weeks went by. I'm talking about months into years. People would get mad. Have you had the hard conversation? Of course, but God's got to change. I can't change them. Like, like, I don't know who you think we are. Like, we can't change them. We got to just create an environment where they can show up, where the Holy Spirit can change them. So one day, and I'll close this out with this. One day, uh, it's two weeks after Easter. We're doing a baptism Sunday, like we're going to do in a few weeks. And at the end of the message, if you're getting baptized today, I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to come forward. We're going to do the little tank up here and five to 10 people stood up. And this is before we had like registrations, anything. So it's like spontaneous, like, okay, I'm getting baptized. So we were all excited, like, woo, we're all cheering. 
and I felt impressed. And I haven't done this since. I mean, I'm telling you, this was the Holy Spirit. I felt impressed. There's one more person. You've been fighting God and, and, and even making a private decision, you fought God. But even right now in this moment, God's telling you, make a public decision. You're going all in with God. And I wasn't thinking about him. I used to think about him every time I do an altar, an opportunity to service because I'd, you know, hand go up and I'd look at him and he'd just like. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about it. I, honestly, I kind of given up hope on him being that person. And in this moment, as the Holy Spirit is in the room, I didn't know what the Holy Spirit was doing, but God was at work even though I didn't see it. I said, if that's you, I want you to stand up. And it was about 15 to 20 seconds of awkward silence with all 300 people in that room. I said, we're gonna wait. And in that moment, in front of his wife, in front of his family, this guy stood up in front of everybody. The atheist of our church. And he walked down front and got into that baptismal tank. And I said, why are you here? I'm telling you, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Why are you here? I'm here to make a decision to say I'm following Jesus the rest of my life. Still to this day, that man and his family are following God. Don't tell me an invite doesn't change. Don't tell me that the Bible, that the gospel still doesn't have power to transform lives. It's not too late for your friends and your family members to come to know Jesus and to follow him the rest of his life. Come on, can we give them better praise than that today, church? Come on, he's worthy of it. Oh, Jesus. Just, just stand across all of our campuses. We're going to close this out. I know I've gone long today. I won't for Easter. I promise you that. I won't. There's a name, there's a burden of a person that God's putting on every single person's heart right now. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think of that name, that friend, that coworker, that loved one, that maybe it's an invite, maybe it's prayer, maybe it's the gospel. I just feel like God is putting that on you right now to say, that's the one, that's your story, that's your person. As soon as you know the one or two names that God's put on your heart, I want you to raise a hand up to heaven right now. I want you to feel God's heart for lost people. God, with our hand raised, break our heart with the things that break your heart, God. Lord, give us a burden for people who don't know you yet. Lord, give us a burden for our friends and our family members, Lord, who are far from you, God. Give us that burden so that we can see them come to new life in Christ Jesus. Let us be the ambassador that you want to use for your honor and your glory. And we just say, God, if you open up the door, we'll walk through it and we'll be obedient to reaching people who are far from you. We thank you for it. Lord, we take a moment right now and we end this service by praying for our friends and family. Come on, just take a moment. Just pray. Even if, it's, if you're comfortable, just pray. Just say that name out loud. Say, God, we pray. We pray for our coworkers. We pray for our, our spouse. We pray for our, our loved ones who are far from you. And we pray, God, would you draw them in? Would your Holy Spirit transform their heart? We'll do our part, but God, you do your part. And let us see salvation spring up in Tampa Bay and lives transformed for an eternity. And we'll give you all the glory and all the honor for it. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody that believes it says, come on, can we give God a little bit more praise than that? Amen. One last group with eyes closed. You're here today. I want you to know God loves you. If you don't have that relationship with Christ, you're not too far gone. You might have thought that friend or that person invited you just to check out their church. The reality is, is that God is trying to get a hold of your life. He loves you so much that our sin has separated us from God, but that's why Jesus came. And now you're t it's your turn to respond. Say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life, I'm giving you my sin, I'm giving you my past. I wanna start fresh. And you can be born again today. If that's you across all of our campuses, on the count of three, just throw that hand up and wave it at me and say, Aaron, today's my day. I'm giving Jesus my life. One, come on, be bold. Two, three. If that's you, come on, throw the hand up all over. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you in the back. Thank you over over here. Man, so many hands all over our campuses. Why don't we all pray this prayer out loud and then our location pastors will come. Say, dear Jesus. Come on, say it loud. Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I give you my sin. I ask that you would forgive me. Thank you for dying for me. I choose to live for you for the rest of my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that believes it says, amen. Come on, let's celebrate just like heaven is. Well, thank you so much for watching Radiant Church YouTube channel. Don't forget, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to this channel right now. You can click the button so you don't miss anything. You can support the ministry by sharing this message with a friend or by clicking the Give Now button that you see on your screen so that we can continue to see lives changed for Jesus. Thanks for watching. The best is yet to come.